us turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about living pleasing to God. And it's amazing because as we've talked about previously, he's excited about their faith because he did not have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with them. But the time that he did spend with them and the reports that he got back from Timothy showed that, that they were very determined to live right for God. But just like us, because of where they were located in the center of Rome, there was a lot of distractions around them. And because of the distractions that were around them, Paul had a great concern. And he did not want their faith to waver. When we look at this, we, it, it causes us to look at ourselves because we too have a lot of distractions around us. And it's amazing because you would think that you would just have these distractions out in the world. That's not true. We have distractions in the world and even in the church. And so Paul, he, he strengthens them by writing to them and telling them, don't allow what you see to distract you from doing what God wants you to do. Don't allow your distractions to distract you to the point where you start, start compromising your bodies, okay, uh, because of the distractions around you. He wants them to stay anchored in the law. It, to stay anchored in the Lord and to stay focused on Him. And a lot of us are going to get a lot out of this today because it's going to talk about some stuff that we're uncomfortable with. Um, it's really going to bring us out of the closet and, and some of us are dealing with this and some of us aren't dealing with this. But as you read the Word of God, let it minister to you where you at in Christ. Amen? Amen? Okay, let us read the fourth chapter. And it reads as such. Finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live in order to please God. As in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do more. To do more of this, more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, he introduces the, script, the, the chapter by saying to them that I've heard about your faith and I've heard about how anchored you are in the Lord, but I want you to be even more anchored in the Lord. Because there's some temptations that's going to come your way that's going to shake you. There are things that you may come against that you've never come against before. And all this time you thought that you were anchored in the Lord. And when you hit that temptation in your life, you found out something about yourself that you didn't know. A lot of us, we feel that we're so anchored in the Lord and, and the Lord got us so covered in his blood that we're okay. But you always got to keep in mind that the devil is very cunning. He's not going to tempt you with what he knows is not going to bother you. He's going to tempt you with the things that he knows that's going to bother you. And so you got to keep in mind there's some things in your life that haven't come your way yet that that Satan is ready for you to get to a certain place in your life 
And then he's going to hit you with things that you've never been hit with before. So he says, I want you, uh, you've been doing a good job. He says, I, I, I like where you are in Christ. But I, he says, I want you to keep studying, and I want you to keep living, and I want you to keep trusting, and I want you to keep studying the word of God. Okay, more and more and more. And he says, and I want you to remember the instructions that I gave you. And he says, I want you to remember this because Satan is always seeking whom he may devour. He's always lurking. He's always looking. He's always messing with you because he knows your weakest spots. Amen? Amen. Now, this is where it gets uncomfortable. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immortality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passion, lust, like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. What is Paul saying to us here? Can anybody help me here? What is Paul saying? Uh, well, what he's talking about being, uh, well, my Bible says, uh, each of you should know how to possess his own vessel for sanctification and honor. You should have control over your body. Right. Um, you know, if, even if you're tempted, you, you can't give in to every lust, every desire. You have to have control over your body. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to jump in there? Because there's things about our bodies that we think we know until we get into the situation. And then once we get into the situation, then we see things that was in us that we didn't know was in us. And so he kind of prepares you before you get into the situation. And he says that I want you to first sanctify yourself. Allow God to clean you up, to prepare your body, so that when these temptations come your way, you will know how to avoid them. Amen? He says not only would you know how to avoid them, you will have control over your body. We see a lot, we talk about the young people of today, we talk about how, how, how these young people today are involved with all of these sexual activities, but we don't want to admit the fact is they get the ideas from us. Because a lot of us are not discreet in the things that we do, and so young kids see so many things at a young age, and when they get older, they want to experience things that they're not ready for. And we have to take some responsibility with this because a lot of things that have been created, it's not something new. Things that are going on is not new. These things have been going on a long time. The problem is it got out of the closet. Amen. And now young people got the ideas in their head and they're experiencing things that they're not ready for. And so now we have children having children. And now we hear children being outspoken about their urges, about their desires. That was something that you didn't hear in the olden days. That wasn't something that was talked about. That was something that was kept in the bedroom. But now it's in the forefront, and we're looking at it, and we're saying, how dare these young people talk about their desires? But the truth of the matter is nobody told them how to control their bodies. So what's happening now, what they're talking about, it's not that it's wrong because we all have desires, but we need to know how to keep it under subjection. Amen? How to keep it under control. Yes, ma'am. Since we're talking about <coughs> sanctification, is he talking more than, more than just sexual mortality? Like he's talking about? Other things other than sex? In, in, in the realm of sex? Or other things like, give me just an example, like? Uh, uh, smoking, drinking, uh, drugs, uh, 
Yes. But he, just emphasizing, in here, they just emphasizing sexual immortality. Well, he, 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 he talk about passions and urges and, and doing things like the heathens do, like the unbelievers. So the unbelievers drink smoke and they do all kinds of things. Why? Because their bodies are not under subjection. They have no control of the urges and the desires and the distractions that are around them. Well, it seems like this is running rapid more so than the other thing. It, it, the reason why he does this is because of where their church was located. It was in the middle of Rome. Rome was a place where they had all <laughs> types of orgies and all kinds of sexual things. It was something that was very explicit. There was something that they did openly. Uh, uh, there was a lot of, of, of sexual problems in Rome. And it was right around the church. And so he was building the faith of the members of the church because he knew that this was a huge distraction that was around him. There was something that was growing rapid. It was something that wasn't hidden. Go ahead. Why is it um, that's such an issue that you think, why do you think that's such an issue today that churches are not, they're scared to discuss that type of, have that type of discussion in church. I think I think one of the biggest problems in the church has been is that it's traditional that it is something that's not discussed. Second thing that I truly believe is because if, if you talk about it, people are afraid that people are going to look at them and say, wow, she must be thinking about it, or he must be thinking about it, and he's talking about it, or he must be active because of the fact is he's very versed at it or something like that. It's something that's, that has been taboo in the church for a very long time, and our children have suffered because of it. But then, too, in our era, we have more respect for ourselves as well as respect for our older generation. And the young kids today, they don't have respect for themselves or the older generation. So it's a difference right there. It, it, the respect factor is, is something that we, we, we agree on. But the fact is, is that we, at some point, should have taken some sort of responsibility and discussed it to prepare them for these sexual desires that they will feel as they grow up. We didn't prepare them, and what happened, the media got to them before we did. I hear you. And so what happened is, is that they, the media began to teach them, and television began to teach them things that we should have been teaching them as they grew up. So we could have prepared them for this. And so what happened is, is that now you have a lot of kids that, that parents that don't want to talk about it, the church doesn't want to talk about it. And so kids have these, 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 these desires, and, and it's out of control, and they don't know how to handle it. So they start experiencing what they feel. And they're not ready for the repercussions that come behind it. And so we, uh, what Paul is doing, he's preparing them because of the simple fact that he doesn't want them to get caught up out there in what they see because it was just so prevalent. It was just so much in their face that, that he knew that eventually, you know, the brothers would be tempted and he wanted them to be strong or the sisters would be tempted. And he, he knew that. And, and, and the thing that I like about this scripture is that he made them be, get in touch with their own desires because it, I'm not inhuman because I have a desire. I'm not a sinner because I have a desire. What, what creates the sin is when I go through the act and I'm not married. Paul talk, talks about that in Corinthians when he says, if, if you have this desire, then you ought to be married. But we don't, we haven't taught people that it, it, it's a, it's understandable that you're going to have these feelings, but you just got to know how to handle them when you get them. Amen? Amen. Any questions before we go further? Okay, so he says, let me read that again. It says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immortality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is 
holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that's in no that is in no matter one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins. As we have already been told, you are warned. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. What is he saying right there in verse 7? For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Is a holy life a perfect life? Is, is a holy life wearing a cross? Walking around with a cross on, letting everybody know that you're saved by that huge cross that you have on? Is a holy life carrying a Bible? Huge Bible, so everybody can think that we're saved. What, what does he mean when he says this? A holy life is living righteous. And by living righteous, treat yourself. Treat other people like you would treat yourself. All you right. Respect. All right. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? We live in accordance with God's standards. It's God's, God's standard is still holiness. Yes. It hasn't changed. It's still the same. Amen. He still requires us to be holy. Amen. So we're not live. We're, we're, we're living. He wants us to live a holy life. And he says, therefore, he who rejects these instructions does not reject man. Listen to this. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his spirit. So if you reject this type of holy life, you're not rejecting me, but you're rejecting God. When you say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. This is my body. I can do what I want to do as long as I don't, I, I, I'm doing it you know, the way I want to do it, and I ain't hurting nobody. You know, it's my body. I can do what I want to do. God says, you ain't, you ain't rejecting man. You rejecting me. Because your body is the temple of God. <clears throat> so you can't just do what you want to do with your body. We have to make sure that we live holy lives before God. Amen? Because what you do can not only offend, that doesn't offend God, but it may hurt somebody else around you. Amen? Sister Robs, you got your hand up? No. Oh, I'm sorry. So what you do may not only offend God, but others around you. Young people see you living your life, see you doing what you want to do, see you running around with different men, see you sleeping with different men. They feel, well, if mama could do it, I could do it. If auntie could do it, I could do it. Amen? She's going to church too, but she's still doing what she wants to do. God says, he says, you're not hurting man. You're not rejecting man. You're rejecting me. Who gives you his Holy Spirit? Because if I have his spirit in me, if I have the spirit of God in me, he is going to keep that feeling in me under subjection. He's going he's to show me how and when to tap into this feeling that I have. He's going to bring the right person to me that I can marry so that I can explore these feelings and desire with someone that I'm married to. Amen? Amen. But, 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 I, but I can't do it unless I have God's Holy Spirit. He says now uh, about brotherly love. We do not need to write to you, for yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do not love all the brothers, therefore, uh, throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business. Make your ambition to live a quiet life, to mind your own business. Make your ambition to live a quiet life. And mind your own business. <laughs> and to work with your hands. Just as we told you. Why do you think Paul is telling him that? 
Why do you think Paul is saying that? Make it your ambition to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands. Why do you think, why do you think Paul is saying that? I guess he was saying don't be a busybody. Okay. That's right. A lot of people in everybody else's business, right? You're right. They in everybody else's business and their lives is a mess. Mm -hmm. Their lives is all out there open for everybody to be spectators of. They're distractions to everybody else around them because they don't live holy lives. But those same people are going to want to come and try to tell you how to live their life. The same people with messed up lives, they have all these problems, situations in their life, they're dating all kinds of men, they're running around with all of these desires, and it's open for the world to see those same people are going to come to you and tell you how to live your life. But Paul says live a quiet life. Keep Your, your life should not be out there at, at, as spectators for people to see that your life is all messed up. That you running around doing whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. Live a quiet life. Get your life together first. Work on you. Allow God to do make the change in your life before, before you start messing with other people's lives. Amen? Amen. Exactly. It's like be, be a good neighbor and clean up your own backyard. Exactly. Exactly. How you going to start digging in my closet when your closet is a mess? Right. Amen? He says, he says, live a quiet, mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, just as I told you. So that your daily life may win, listen to this, that your daily life will win outsiders so that you will not be dependent on anybody else. I love that. We can get the benediction on that alone right there. So that your daily lives may win the respect I want people to respect me, not because they fear me, because they see Christ in me. Amen. I, don't, I want people to respect me, not because I have this beautiful car that I drive around, but inside of that car is a person that lives a raggedy life. I'm running around with all types of people. I'm doing what I want to do. A beautiful car but I'm living a messed up life. Dressed to kill, but inside I'm dying because my life is a mess. Got a beautiful wife on my own, but I'm not happy. And I'm always in everybody else's business. Why? Because it makes me not look at my life. It's easier to deal with somebody else's mess than to deal with my own. But he says, he says, with the hands that you have, he says, he says, do the work with your hands. Me, use your hands and start working on your life. Stop, stop digging in other people's mess when your life is all a mess. Amen. Amen. He says, he says, make. Let me read this one more time. He said, so that your daily life may win the respect of others so that you will not be dependent on nobody else. That's the end of that that I love the most because what happens is when your life is messed up, when you're doing what, 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 what you know you shouldn't be doing, you become dependent on other people to cover up your mess. Amen? Now you only gotta say amen. I know, I know how this works. You see, when your when your life is jacked up, jacked up, you know what you start doing? You start telling so many lies that you forgot the last lie you told. And you start looking for people to cover up your lies. Because you done told so many lies because you're trying to cover up your mess. Because you don't want to deal with the reality of your life. But the scripture says, so that you will not be 
dependent on nobody else. I, the only person that I need to depend on to get my life in order is Christ Jesus. I don't need nobody to help me cover my lies. I don't want, need nobody to help me make my life worse than what it is. I need Jesus Christ to come in my life and create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit in me because my life is a mess. And, and I got all kinds of sexual desires in me. I have all kinds of lust running through me. I got this passion that's running out of control. I don't need somebody else in my life to make it a mess. I need Jesus because only Jesus is going to help me keep my life under control. Amen? Amen. Amen. Only Jesus. No psychiatrist. Not your best friend. Not your mother. Not your dad. The only one that can help you clean up this mess that's inside of you is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Anybody would like to add to that? Like you said, it's life. Because you look today, even young people, old people, and you said stuff about that. They do what everybody else do, so such thing. My mom told us that. That from you out there jumping from the car, you move out there too? That's right. I mean, how am I on your own? You ain't got to follow nobody. That's right. That's right. And that's the way I'm kind of living my life. That's right. I don't need no follow. That's right. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus, yeah. Yes, brother. I'm kind of struggling in that area. I'm trying to follow Jesus a couple of months and times now. And I don't see the precise connection coming to me in spite of what I'm going through or went through. I've been dealing with this problem. And I am trying to connect to Jesus Christ. And I don't have the connection. How can I change the situation? One of the problems here that the scripture teaches us is that you got to understand that if you truly want to connect to Christ, you have to be willing to let go. And, and I mean when I say that is, is that when he talks about this desire that I have, like this desire to make my relationship work, this desire this feeling that's bubbling deep down inside, I have two choices. Either I give it to Jesus or I give in to my desire. There's, two, there's only two things I can do. I can either give it to Jesus and let him control the desire that's inside of me or I can just give in to the desire. I only have two choices. If I really want to connect, then that means I have to walk away from desire and give it to Jesus. If I want to connect with Jesus and I'm still holding on to the desire, then I'm never going to make the connection. You understand? But you have to completely give it to Jesus. A lot of us says, I'm trying to connect, but I'm still holding on to that thing that I'm dealing with or I'm feeling. Christ doesn't need you to hold on to the things that you're feeling. He wants you to grab a hold to him. Amen. And that's letting those things go that are behind me and pressing toward those things which are before me. I'm pressing toward the mark of the higher calling, which is in Christ Jesus. You understand? Amen. So there has to be a point in your life when you're willing to let go. I mean totally let go. And that's something that God gives every man which is choice. You have to make that choice to let go. Yes. Choose you this day who you will serve, will it be God or will it be man? Yes, sir. You got the desire, right? You want Jesus. So what's more important to you, the desire or the relationship with Jesus? Now that's the one, so he doesn't make that choice. You got to make that choice. You see what I'm saying? What do you love more? What you're holding on to? Or do you love Jesus? So if you love him and you want that true connection, then you got to let that thing go. Let it go. And the reality is, I'm going to let you go. The reality of passion, of something that you really love, this is an honest feeling. This is the truth. 
The truth is, a lot of times we don't want to let it go because we really love it so much. I hear you. Now that, that's some, people not going to really tell you that, but that's really the honest truth. Mm -hmm. When you really have a desire for something, I love this woman. Even though I know this woman is no good for me, I still love her. Right? I have a passion for her. I have a lust for her. Even though she doesn't love me, I love her. Until I decide that I'm going to let her go, I'll never be able to really love Jesus Christ. Amen. You got it? Yes. Make sense? Yes. But then he have to examine himself to find out what is he doing wrong that he can't live with it, within himself before he examines uh, the other party. Right. But he's so caught up in the... See, I want him to see his passion. He has such a passion. He's saying, Jesus, I love you. I want you. Jesus, I love you. But he's still holding on to the passion. You can't have it both ways. I hear you. You can't have it both ways. See, that, that's what you got to decide. What's more important? What do you want more? You can't have it both ways. You know, we God is taking things from us. There's a lot of things we say, God, take this passion out of my life. And God says, okay, I'm ready to take it out of your life. And we're like, okay, God, I want you, but we're still running after the passion. <laughs> but And God is saying, but you told me to take it away from you. The truth of the matter is we really didn't really, really want God to take it away. We just wanted God to keep it under some sort of control, but still keep the passion in. I don't, it's not like I really want to lose this woman I love, even though I know she's no good for me. I just want you to change her so that we can be together. See, we want to compromise with God. You, you, there's no compromise with God. It doesn't work that way. If, if it's not good for you, if, it's, if, if, God didn't, if God didn't ordain it to be, then it's not meant to be. I gotta let it go. You want to come at it? If, you, if the question is, did God bring the marriage together? Was it meant to be, or did you do it? Is this someone that you decided you just wanted to be with, even though you knew that? Then how, how do we? Was this is this a really a marriage that was put together by God? You know, see, these are the honest things that people don't like to talk about. We just look at the word marriage, and then we automatically feel, if I'm married, that God brought it together. And the truth of the matter is, if we really tell the honest truth, a lot of times we were infatuated. So because we were infatuated, we got together. We just looked like the perfect couple, so we got together, and then we call it God. See, it doesn't work that way. We have to allow God to bring marriages and relationships together. And when God brings it together, it's going to work. Hallelujah. And what, what God did not put together will not stay together. Hallelujah. Make sense? That's hard, but it's, this is reality. Yes? I just want to ask a question. Okay, when he, when the, when sometimes when we first get married, we are both on equal, you know, you're not both, not with God. Okay, one, if one get with God and the other one is not, don't we supposed to try and try to bring the other one along with us? We're supposed to live the life. Uh, yes. We're supposed to try, but understand, you know, God tells us not to be unequally yoked. Right. You decided that you wanted to be unequally yoked. You try and you try and he decides not, he doesn't want to change or she doesn't want to change. That, that how can we go to God and say, God, why did you allow this to happen to you? But what I'm saying, both of us out, both of us was out in the world before we got married. Oh, both of us? Yes. Okay. Now that I changed and he have, don't I supposed to work and work till I try to get him to change? Yes. Go to God and ask him, you know, to yes. change him? Yes. If it's sad in the Because we both was on equal. Right. But, but understand, just because you found Christ and he didn't, it, I, the, the thing that I want people to understand is that don't think because you found Christ that God is going to turn his life around. He has to turn his life around when, when God has it predestined for him too. And think about this. He may never turn his life around. Right. Well, I'm right. saying you're supposed to pray that he will. You're supposed to turn it over to God. You don't keep taking it back. Once you turn to God, you're supposed to give it to God and let God 
take over. Yes. That's what you're supposed to do. But the reality, I just want us to see the reality of that. There's a gamble in that. Yes. And that's why God he puts it in his word that you be. When I'm counseling and I see two people unequally yoked, I, I let them know yeah. that I'll marry you, but this is not something that I think you should do. I'm going, be very, I'm going to be very honest with them. Because of the, how you're taking a gamble. You're, you're thinking that just because God changed your life, that he's automatically going to change her life. And that, that just may not happen. Okay, and it, and it doesn't happen with what you're supposed to do. Now there's going to be a fight. You got you be prepared that there's going to be a lot of differences and there's going to be a lot of arguments and there's going to be a lot of problems and he, you're going to be going to church and he's going to be mad because you didn't cook his dinner before you went to church and, and you going to church too much and you doing this too much because you're unequal. But just keep praying that God. And, you, you, and, and I, I'm not for divorce. You keep praying, but understand what the Bible tells us. And so we're just living out the consequences for what we have done. But may I say to Mary that, you know, because uh, it's kind of like what I'm doing now is, you know, you just I found that if you just keep, you know, doing you and he see the God in you, he's going to get something. Amen. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? So he's going to get something. Amen. And then eventually it'll come. You keep trying. You yeah, never you stop keep, trying. You just keep living, doing yeah. you. And, you know, he'll see the God in you, and he'll want some of that. Amen. The, 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 the message, and I'm coming right to you, brother. The message that I want to send to this new generation is that you, we got to keep in mind, our generation, we had the stamina to stand through all of the hard times of marriage. This young generation doesn't. They don't have that same no stamina. They divorce. They want a problem, they want a divorce in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone doesn't teach yeah. them what the Bible says, what happens to them, then they, they start off wrong. Mm -hmm. They start off wrong, and then they continue. We have that stamina to, to, to stay in there no matter what. We work through it. He's, he's out there doing this thing. I'm, I'm going to keep praying for him. I'm going to keep living the life for him. We have that stamina. Mm -hmm. We have that relationship. But this new generation does not have that stamina. So I don't want to say to them, Go ahead and try it and just believe God and God will change it around. Just keep living the life because they do not have the same stamina they do. Day two, they're ready to divorce. Look at statistics. They will tell you, marriages today, based on statistics, is not working. Young people today are getting divorced more now than ever. Go ahead, brother. Oh, uh, well, I've been married for like, 30 years, and the only reason I'm married is because of Jesus. That's the only reason. And there's no other reason that we're married but Jesus, okay? Because he's like right between us. He's, you know, and what I wanted to say was, you know, you got to answer the call. When he calls you, you can't answer for your spouse or nobody else. You got to say yes, Jesus, for yourself, okay? I mean, it's, it's good where they can see Christ in you. That's all good. But you still, when he calls you, you know, to him, you got to answer him yourself. Yes. You can't, you, I mean, your mother can't answer for you. Your father can't answer. Can't nobody answer for you. Right, right. you got to answer for yourself. And that's what it comes down to. You know, you know what I mean? I ain't got to answer for what my wife, even though we're married and we've been married, I got to answer for what he's given, the life that he's given me. Right. I mean, she might want me to do one thing, and I got to, you know, find out what the Lord wants me to do. It may, it may come together, or it may, we may be going, you know, different apart sometimes on what we do and how, you know, sometimes she's upstairs, sometimes I'm downstairs, you know. Right. But you, basically, you got to answer. You gotta answer the Lord. For, I mean, when He calls you, you gotta answer yes for yourself. Okay. And, and, and that—that's my point. You know, I, that's, I was picking yes. up on your point. Yes, I was picking yes, up on your point. definitely, definitely. And, 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 and if we can, if we can be honest, see, that's an honest answer. You know, being married 26 years, a lot. Of, you know, that's just an honest 
answer. You know, I, I just want to be honest with you because me and my wife was not, both of us wasn't saved at the same time. We didn't marry being, that we, you know, we weren't married saved, okay? So my, the Lord saved my wife right afterwards, you know? And so our marriage was based on passion. You know, we were, in, we were just in love with each other. But we didn't understand marriage. Being in love and marriage is two different things. Because I can love you, but not stand, can't stand your guts. And so we had to learn the, the difference between the two. You see what I'm saying? We were madly in love with each other. It, we, it was crazy because when we got married, we didn't even argue anymore. Because the simple fact that we just wanted to be together. Yeah. But I wasn't yeah. ready. I wasn't ready for marriage. I said, I don't mind being together with you. That I gotta be with you all the time. <laughs> what? No, I struggle with that. I gotta give you my money is your money? Right. What? <laughs> you know, right. we making decisions together about everything. This was new to me. So I, so I I was like, you know, that had nothing to do with love. We were married, so I knew we had to do things differently. And that was a struggle. Yes, sir. But, but because the Lord had saved my wife and me at that point in our relationship, our relationship and our passion for each other became a marriage. And then we became married, and then it became okay. It's like, okay, you want to paint the room blue? No problem. Go ahead. All right. All right, I can deal with blue. Maybe you don't even like blue, but that's all right, baby. It's all right. Baby. All right. You know, you want to eat this tonight? I don't even like that. I'll make you laugh. Don't tell I told you this. My wife one day decides, I'm country, born in a country home. Good meals all the time. Grandma cook whatever you like. She had the nerve. We just get married. She brings me a TV dinner. Oh. Oh. <laughs> a TV dinner. I said, baby, I've never seen, I know it's a hungry man, but I've never seen a TV dinner. She cried. Because she was trying to do the right thing. She just wanted to make sure I had a meal. Because I, the way I reacted, I was like, a TV dinner? Right? I never seen a TV dinner in my, on TV, I saw it, but never in my household. I closed my eyes and I ate that dinner. <laughs> and that was the hardest I ever did. Eat that dinner. Had no taste of nothing to it. But I ate it because we were, that's the Lord. That love part. That marriage thing was like, what's up with this? But the love was like, okay, I'll eat it. But I don't want people, our young people, to go into relationships thinking that you can base a marriage on just love alone. That's right. Amen? Amen. Because it, it's much more than just passion and love and, and, and just having great, making great love with each other. It's more than that. It's Amen. just so much more than that. Amen. At the end of the day, I got to like it. You know what I mean? And so what happens is because of this, we have this this crazy thing that's going inside of us. And because we are constantly warring, which we learned last night in our flesh, and we don't know about this treasure that's inside of us, the quickest thing that we go to is like, you know what? I'm divorcing you because you don't know how to cook. You don't know how to paint the room blue, and I don't like blue. So I'm out of the marriage. But when I realize that I have a treasure inside of me, then I tap into my treasure, which is the power of the Holy Ghost. And it teaches me how to love. You understand? Amen. So those are the marriages that make it. And these other things that we call marriage, they struggle. My, my grandmother and grandmother, my grandmother and grandfather were married for 50 years. But they were married on principle, not on love or anything else. Okay, thank you. Was, there was none of that in the relationship. It was just principle, two people together. Because of that old-fashioned belief, you got to hang in there. And so when I became married, I didn't have anything to draw on but principle. 
So you know, you just gotta hang in there no matter what, TV dinners and all, just hang in there and eat it. But I thank God that I got more, that he gave me more. He gave us more. She started saying, let me start cooking things that I know that he likes. You know what I mean? Baby, what, what color you want to paint the room? Where do you want to go eat? We started working compromising together because it became a marriage. Make sense? Yeah. Make sense to you? It's a marriage. It's a work in the process. It's a work in Yes, every yeah. single yeah. day. Yeah. And, and that's why this scripture helps us to understand. Uh, remember that latter part, which he says, he says, uh, he says, uh, so that you, your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that you would not be dependent on anybody else. Yes, sir. You want that relationship that you have with your wife. My, my relationship is not, she's not just depending on me or I'm depending on her, but we're both depending on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because yeah. he, is, he is our anchor. He's the one that keeps it together. She don't get up in the morning saying, you, you know, I can't make it without you. If something happens to you, I'm going to die. If, if you're not around, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm not saying the same, but we're both looking to Jesus, and he becomes our anchor. Don't, I'm not crazy to think that when my wife walks out the door and I walk out the door, my wife may say, wow, he's a, that's a handsome young man. Or, you know what, I like the way he's wearing that suit. But at the end of the day, because she has the power of the Holy Spirit in her, in her that keeps her under subjection. Hallelujah. She doesn't look at it with a, with a, with a lust. She, she, she looks at it as a compliment. Hallelujah. Make sense? Yeah. If, I, if I look at a woman in a pretty dress, I go home, I say, Diet, I saw this lady, she had on this bad blue dress. Like in our house, Miss Thompson, you are, you, your name goes, did you see how Miss Thompson wore that hat today? Did you see that? <laughs> and it's, we, we, we say it in a way that it compliments. And so now when she goes in the store, let me see if I can wear that hat like Sister Thompson wears. Or I can, you know, or I can dress or I can look buff like Mike. It's not like I'm being funny. I'm, 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 I'm looking at it in a sexual way or anything because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of me. Amen? Amen. And this is what the Spirit of the Lord it, it, it is saying to us. And uh, we're going to stop right there because next week we're going to be talking about the coming of the Lord. See, he does all and says all of this about preparing the mind, body, and soul because of what we're going to talk about on next week. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord a hand praise, everybody. <laughs> Subjects like these that I couldn't wait to pastor to talk about. Because for so long, these subjects were not talked about in the church. For so long. And I could not wait to get to a point in life where I can talk about these things. Because a lot of us are going through struggles in our relationships. And we're struggling with desires. We're struggling with these passions. <coughs> And we're not honest with ourselves and bringing them to the altar and say, Lord, they're in me. Lord, take it out of me. I don't want to be like this. We struggle with it all of our lives. And then we become 50 years old and 60 years old. And we can't understand why we're still struggling with that passion. And, the, and, and you don't see, you, you don't see, you see nothing but stress and unhappiness all over the face of the why? Because they got this thing deep down inside of them and they don't know what to do with it. And my prayer is to help you to understand that you're human, <coughs> that you got feelings and you think things, but you need the power of the Holy Ghost to put it under control, to show you how to use it. You have to read the Word of God to let you know that when you have certain desires, maybe that's time for you to get married and be with somebody. Maybe that's the time for you to go out and stop looking. Maybe that's the time for you to let go, really let go, and let God give you what he really wants to give you. Maybe God hasn't waited for you. You ever thought about it? 
maybe the, your true happiness, God is waiting to give it to you the minute that you let go. Why would you die in sorrow when God could have complete happiness waiting for you the minute you let go and let God? Make sense? Don't, don't die unhappy, brother. God has happiness waiting for you, but he's waiting for you to commit to him 100% and totally let go and let God. All right? Let us all stand.